G'day everyone, welcome back to the Nerd Cave. Sorry it's been so long. We are streaming live on YouTube, hopefully in 4K. So, interested to hear in the chat whether you're able to access the 4K. If you go down to the little settings cog in the bottom corner, you should be able to get a little quality upgrade there. If you don't, please let me know in the chat uh, because it heard some rumors that YouTube's only letting people watch 4K if they pay for premium or something like that. But as you can tell, I'm a little uh, absent from the YouTube scene for a while, so um, maybe someone knows that better than I do. Like I said, do feel free to throw questions during this uh, little demo into the chat. If there's something that you want to know, I'd much rather be able to tell you something you're, inter you're interested in or anyone wants to pull me up on my bullshit, you're more than welcome to do that. Gives you a chance to also get your name in lights, which is just huge, I know, just with the massive number of people that are obviously going to be watching this. <coughs> if I push a button here, look, someone's already put a comment in the chat. Thanks to Cadence, who says you're back. Missed your videos, and again, I really apologise for the absence. Um, my new year's resolution is to do this very regularly next year, rather than just making videos when YouTube send me that uh, email that says we're going to cut off your monetization due to inactivity. Uh, so here we are for you know great reasons, um, and like I said, it's going to be a chance to demo the new Lauer Nanomorph and size it up against obviously a much more expensive and much more established anamorphic lens, but I think it's going to be a really interesting comparison and it's going to be able to, these two options are going to fit a lot of different markets and a lot of different use cases. Um, so why don't we get into it and have a quick look at the Nanomorph itself. Um, oh, and David White, thanks for letting us know that 4K is working. So look, I've managed to somehow get five 4K camera angles into vMix, which I'll quickly take you through in a second, but um, thanks for that little bit of reassurance to, to know that it's actually working. Much appreciated. So let's have a quick look at the Nanomorph itself. So there it is, sitting on the Red Raptor. That's the 50mm there, and look how tiny that thing is. Let me just um, hold up. This is the 65mm Atlas Orion there, just as a little size comparison. And I've included the RF to EF adapter on the back there so that it is a true apples with apples comparison. Because one of the really great things about these nanomorphs is they can come in mirrorless mounts, such as this RF native mount, which goes straight on the Raptor without an adapter. That rhymed. Uh, and gives you a really low profile, um, really compact build. Now, the size of this thing actually introduces a few challenges which we'll chat about in a second, particularly with an example I've got over there on the Canon C70. Um, but, I mean, the, when these arrived, the first thing that hit me was how the hell have they managed to squeeze that much glass into such a small package? I mean, anamorphic takes some serious optics to be able to do what it does. By the way, if anybody watching isn't familiar with anamorphic, photography and the optical characteristics and the reason why people get excited about it. Don't hesitate to say so in the chat. I'm kind of moving ahead assuming that most of the people watching know what anamorphic is and kind of know the rough pros and cons of it. Um, but by all means, if you don't, hit me up and we'll be able to chat about that a little bit further. So I've just got this here on the Raptor with a little uh, Nucleus M motor and um, just a little hand grip on the tripod pan handle there so I can pull focus. Um, and we'll have a look at the footage in a second, but why don't I just quickly take you around, show you the different camera angles so you get a feel for what we're going to play with today. So we've got a C70 here, which is on a little Red Rock Micro one-man crew, providing a nice little autonomous dolly angle that kind of has a slight curve to it, so it sort of holds its focal length. Um, I've hooked up the little a, a Nucleus Nano motor to it, so I do actually have the ability to pull focus there. There you can see the little oval bokeh of the cheesy fairy lights I put in the background, both for technical purposes and because, you know, it's almost Christmas, yeehaw. Uh, next up, we've got a red Komodo with, uh, that's the Orion 40 mil that we're gonna be using for comparison there. Um, and that's running uh, at, on, on the Komodo, what it's called is 6K, you'll see there at the bottom, four by three, 2x. The 2x refers to the squeeze factor of the anamorphic, so how much it's actually squeezing the world optically into the sensor, and then when you get into post, you stretch it back out, and that's how you get all the funky awesomeness of anamorphic. Um, then if we move across here, we've got the nano, new, the Lauer Nanomorph 35mm on another uh, Komodo, and this one's mounted on the DJI RS3 Pro. So as you can see here, I've got my little remote control here that I actually stole out of a tilter float system that I'll probably never use. So this works out to be about a $2,000 controller, but it actually has come in really handy. I'm gonna do another episode pretty soon on showing you how I managed to get the RS3 Pro mounted on top of my Steadicam Zephyr, which actually turns it into like a poor man's Ari Trinity. So if anyone's keen to check that out, let me know. 
Uh, other camera angles we've got here, the one that I was just showing you before was the C500 Mark II, which has got a, um, a Sigma 35mm 1.4 on there. I think I'm actually running it at 2.8 at the moment. And then we've got the Raptor, which is the one that's got the Lauer 50mm on there. So if I just let this one free, you can see there, that's the Raptor. And later on I'll be able to uh, change the project settings on the Raptor just to give you an idea of coverage. So at the moment this Raptor is running at 6K, 16.9, 1.5 squeeze, and it's obviously capable of going up to 8K, so you'll be able to see how the uh, coverage of that works out. So what I might do now is grab the old phone with the magic of NDI and just race around the room and show you all the different rigs so you've got a feeling for what we're playing with today. So I've just got the... Uh, First generation DJI Osmo, very sexy piece of equipment. Let's cut across to the phone and I'll head over here to the main event, which is our two comparison cameras. So you can see here we've got, oh, okay, the Osmo's just freaked out. That's uncool. Bear with me, technical issues. Okay, I might end up hand holding this phone, but anyway. So here we've got the Orion 40mm. I'm running it at about 2.8 just to match up to the 35 mil. Okay, we're going to take that phone off. The first generation technology is failing us. I apologize, everybody. Here we go. We're going handheld. A little bit more Blair Witch project, but I'm sure you can bear with me. So, yeah, we're running the 40 mil at about 2.8 because just to sort of match up to... Oh, this one actually can go to 2.4, but I think we've, I've stopped this one down a little bit just to help with the sharpness. And so as far as the rigs go... This one's got, so it's a Komodo here with the Ignite Digi cage around it. Um, that This big box here is actually my tally light, so it tells me it goes green when I'm in preview and goes red when that camera's actually been selected. Up the top here is the Teradek RT rangefinder, which is, the, they call it the TOF-1. Uh, and around the side there, you'll see that's the MDR for the Teradek, so that lets me plug up to three motors or two motors in the rangefinder. Um, into the red there and uh, what else can I show you on that one? It's basically just sitting on a tripod, nothing fancy there. And then over here we've got another Komodo with the Nanomorph 35mm, 1.5 times squeeze. Up the top here is the ridiculously capable DJI, DJI LiDAR Focus, which we're going to talk about and do a little comparison between the two and see how they go. Uh, as you'll see here, this is kind of what I was referring to before, the build side, the, the actual diameter of these lenses is so small that one thing you're going to have to really keep in mind is how you mount your focus gears. So you can see here, it's okay on a Komodo because the Komodo is quite a small camera body, but if you start getting up into a bigger camera body with little focus systems like this DJI, you're going to end up where it's just, it's, it's going to end up hanging down below the lens and never being able to make contact with the gears. So that's something to think about. Over here, we've got the Canon C70. And this is the one where I found it really, really difficult to mount a motor and actually getting it to make contact with the lens because of how small these lenses are. I actually ended up using the base plate that came with the Nucleus Nano, which when I first bought that system, I almost threw it in the bin because I figured I'd never use it. But here it comes being extremely uh, useful. And I'm powering that focus motor off this really sexy battery pack, which completely doesn't match everything else, but I'll get over that. And one thing to note as well, at the moment, the C70 only has anamorphic modes for two times and 1.8 times squeeze. It actually, sorry, 1.3 times squeeze. It doesn't actually do 1.5 times squeeze. So it's not a huge issue because all it's doing is really showing you a preview that's sort of an approximation of what the anamorphic's gonna be. So I'm actually running this uh, at 1.3 squeeze on the LCD there, which you can sort of see. And then I'm running it into this Shogun here, and the Shogun's actually got, sorry, let me turn that off. I'm actually using the anamorphic um, stretch in the Shogun to provide, probably can't, probably won't show up too well there, but the Shogun's actually compressing that to 1.5 accurately for me. When that goes back into vMix, it actually comes through um, completely uh, in its native form, so then you have to do the scaling in vMix to make that work. Over here on the Canon C500, again, I've got the flex light, sorry, flex tally on the top there to tell me when the camera goes live. And it's got a little Sigma 35mm, and it's the hero shot 
for the Raptor, which has the Nanomore 50 mil. Got a little zoom uh, focus controller there on the pan handle. And we got the Nucleus M motor. So again, I had to sort of get a little creative to be able to make, get that to make contact with the lens. So coming off a little stub rail off the top there to be able to get close enough to make contact. So yeah, just something worth thinking about in terms of how these lenses work. And then in the background, like I said, some really sloppy art direction in terms of the fairy lights, but they're gonna provide us a little bit of a technical help later on. All right, so let me cut to something a little more useful like that. Welcome back. All right, hope that helped you get a bit of a rough idea. We might refer to the phone again later just to show you particularly some of the things on the RS3 Pro for people who haven't played around with the Active Track or the DJI LiDAR Focus. Um, so why don't we get straight into a comparison between the two so I can, I'll get you a little bit of a top and tail here, which is on the top, we've got the Orion, which is on a Komodo. The bottom is the Nanomorph 35mm. Again, that's on a Komodo. And the settings are all pretty standardized. So I've tried to make them as close as possible. One thing to note is the way the, that RED provides those anamorphic modes, it, it, they're not all apples with apples, depending on what kind of squeeze factor you're using with your lenses. So. In the case of the two times squeeze of the Orion, uh, it gives you what they call a four by three aspect. I don't quite understand where that comes into it. I think it's something to do with which, how much of the original sensor they're using to accept the squeezed image and then how they unsqueeze it. I'm not, that, I haven't really got that deep into the tech of it, but I'll get back to you on that one, I suppose. And then you can see that at the bottom there, when you're using a 1.5 times lens, it's actually a 6K 16.9 mode that it sets the camera to. But you know, you can see you're getting a fairly commensurate kind of a framing. I've moved, because the Nanomorph's a 35 mil and the Atlas is a 40 mil, I've just moved the 35 mil a little closer to me to kind of match the framing. Um, one thing that I guess stood out to me straight away when I saw them side by side was the, uh, the Orion has more of a green tinge to it, um, which I actually like. I, th I find it a little bit more pleasing. The Nanomorph tends to skew a little more magenta and a little more into the blues. Uh, and that's, um, I guess, for me, that's more of a Sony kind of a look, which I've always had issues with, but sorry, I'm just gonna double check something here. That's all good. Uh, I mean, it's horses for courses, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the Orion, I think it's something like a $12,000 lens, whereas the Nanomorph is, I think I paid 3,000 for a kit of three. So, you know, maybe it's a 12th of the cost of the, of the Orion. So it's not really a fair comparison when it comes to budget, but, um, I think if I had to choose, I would choose the Orion, but do you really want to spend $11,000 just to get that? I mean, I'm sure you could grade it to kind of make up for that sort of a look. Other than that, probably the next thing to talk about when it comes to anamorphics is the, the characteristics everyone seeks after when it, and the reasons why people go to these crazy lengths to shoot this weird optically squeezed image. The first one, I suppose, is uh, the... The flares is probably the, the, the most noticeable thing that people remember about anamorphic. You can see here, both the cameras are picking up some fairly nice little flares off my gratuitous anamorphic flare lights. We've got the Dito 150s in the back there, two of them. Um, the Orion's getting a little bit more funk to its flare, so you can see it's got some of those little kind of wavy patterns in there, whereas the Nanomorph, it's more of just your straight kind of surgical blue line. Worth noting that the Nanomorphs, you can actually order them with three different colors. You can get silver, amber I think it is, or orange or amber, and then blue. So this is obviously the blue variant of that. Um, just quickly on mounts as well, the Nanomorphs can come in a range of different mirrorless mounts. I've gone with the RF version, but I think you can get E-mount and a few others. Um, and then you can also get it with your more standard EF mount or PL mount, which is a larger lens. I actually put more, there's more of a, um, a housing on the back of it to facilitate that. So it makes the lens actually physically bigger if you're going for EF or PL. Um, but yeah, just with this kind of a mirrorless setup, it's a really nice little compact um, unit. So I suppose some of the other things that make uh, anamorphic fairly sought after is you get this kind of strange characteristic between the foreground and the background. For me, and again, I don't know if this is technically correct, but for me, whenever I see anamorphic footage, it always feels like there's more space between the foreground and the background, especially when you pull focus. You feel like there's, there's a far more separation between the foreground and the background over and above what the depth of field is giving you, if that makes sense. It's almost like an optical illusion that kind of stretches the, the background further away from the foreground. That's the feeling I always get when I look at it. And that's gonna be more exaggerated with the Orion, you'll see in a second, than it is with the, the Nanomorph, solely because 
The Orion's a two time squeeze, whereas the Nanomorph is a 1.5 time squeeze. One of the other things that most people notice when it comes to anamorphics is the strange bokeh characteristics. So part of the reason why I've got the fairy lights here is out of focus points of light on a spherical lens, a standard lens will be circular. So let's have a look here. If I go to the C500 and you'll see there the fairy lights in the background are little circles. Whereas if I go to the C70 and then rack it out of focus, you can see there there's an elliptical shape to the out of focus uh, lights. And that's less pronounced on the 1.5 squeeze than it is on the two. Let me just give you a little example of that. See if I can find my focus again. So if we go back to the, the side by side comparison. So if I go, just lost my main preview monitor, which doesn't help me much with this next part. Let's see if I can get it back. Uh, so what I'm going to do is going to show you a little, it's going to show you two things here. It'll show you what I'm talking about with the, uh, that optical characteristic when you pull focus to the foreground. It's also going to give you a little preview of how these um, range finder focus systems go, which should be interesting. Don't forget, if you've got any questions, uh, don't hesitate to throw something in the chat if you want to weigh in or you want to share your own experiences or hit me up with anything. Just let me see if I can get this preview back because it might be necessary for me to frame this up for you. No, it doesn't look like that's going to come back. All right, we'll just pretend. Okay, so if I move up towards this lens here, you're going to see what I was talking about before with the out of focus lights. So you can see there, they're a little bit more elliptical or a little more vertically stretched on the Orion at the top than they are on the Nanomorph at the bottom. And again, that's because the Orion's a two times squeeze, whereas the Nanomorph is a 1.5 times squeeze. And while we're here, I guess you can kind of get a feel for how these focus systems work. So this one at the top, the Orion, is a very directional, fairly narrow beam system in terms of the rangefinder. Like if I, if I move my head over this way, you'll see it pretty quickly pulls to the background. I can come back in, it's, it's pretty snappy. But yeah, there's not a heap of tolerance in terms of the width of this thing and how it picks up the subject. So if the subject's not kind of center framed, assuming that you've got the rangefinder pointing straight in the center, as soon as they move off axis, it's gonna lose them. So, that's something to consider. I mean, they're, they're not necessarily designed to be used for autofocus. That's just a little bonus that, that um, Teradek have enabled with the firmware. Um, they're mostly for focus pullers to actually d figure out the range of the subject and they'll get a little readout on screen if they use the small HD monitors and they can just use that range to kind of make decisions about what they're gonna pull focus to. Um, whereas with the Nanomorph, it's actually using a, a kind of a face detect to pick me up. That's why I'm able to move basically anywhere in the frame and it's keeping me pretty tack sharp. As far as minimums go, sorry to shove my face right in your screens, everybody. You can see there, I'm just past it. So that's about the minimums there of the 35 mil nanomorph. And then I don't actually have a preview of this one, so I'm just guessing, but if I keep coming forward, that's minimums there on the 40 mil. And you can see that the, uh, the DJI focus has lost me. But if I pop back in here, you can see how quickly that zaps back in. So there's a little preview on how those range finders work. Let me just sit back here for a second. Hey Callum, how's it going man? Don't forget if you want to weigh in and uh, throw in any, qu any questions, feel free to. Hey Luke, how's it going man? Little question there from Luke. This picture over picture comparison. Oh, thanks man. The 35 mil seems sharper. Is that something you've noticed in the lens or is it to do with how you've set up the sensor? I do think it's sharper. I mean, the Every lens is sharper the more you go away from wide open. So I've got them both sitting at about 2.8. The Orion is a, is a T2 lens, so that's a decent ways off wide open, whereas the Nanomorph is a 2.4 lens currently sitting at 2.8. So neither of them are running fully, fully wide open. But yeah, I do find the Nanomorph to be a lot sharper. And that, I guess, is sort of a, a quality choice in some ways. Like the, the softness, uh, I should also say the softness of the Orion could have something to do with how I've calibrated the autofocus system. Um, so unfortunately, oh, actually I can see here, I'm, I'm sorry that I've lost my big preview here, guys. It kind of makes me sound like a bit of a dumbass the way I'm doing it. But let me just see if I go into here, turn off the rangefinder autofocus. That means I've got manual control now. So if I try and find, so I mean, to my eye, that kind of looks, about sharp there if I try not to move. 
So if that gives you a little bit of a comparison, because there is, there is definitely a calibration that you have to go through with that Teradek rangefinder system where you're actually feeding into the lens map every single focus mark on the lens to try and build a profile of that lens. And then you also have to be really careful about telling the system where the rangefinder sits in relation to the sensor, sensor plane. So if the rangefinder is forward or aft of the sensor plane, you have to tell the system that and kind of dial it in by inches or millimeters. So being the impatient bugger that I am, there's a chance that I haven't done that as accurately as, it, as I could have. Um, let me just turn the autofocus back on and that might tell you. So if I flick that back on now, there it is. So if I put my hand forward, you can see it pull focus to my hand and then take it back, move out. Oh, hasn't quite picked that up. Hello. Oh yeah, that's working. So yeah, that could be something to do with it. But yeah, I mean, for, when I was setting all this up to answer your question, Luke, I definitely found that Nanomorph was sharper in a way that I didn't like as much as the Orion. I mean, digital sensors are so clinical and so clean. A lot of people go and seek out things like super speeds or vintage lenses or anything like that to try and take the edge off the digital look and give it, make it feel a little bit more organic, a little bit more messed up. And I kind of like that in the Orions. So I sort of prefer the look of that myself. Um, but I mean, if you're going for something that needs, I mean, sorry, anamorphic's probably not the format you want to shoot if you're doing heavy VFX or anything like that, only because of the geometry of the whole thing. If you're having to squeeze and unsqueeze things on set and after the fact, that can often mess with your, your VFX pipeline, I suppose, in some ways. But um, Luke, you'd know more about it than I would. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's, it, like I said, I should be a little bit more careful with how I calibrate the top one, the rangefinder. But, um, and just to sort of touch on that as well, if I grab the phone, I can show you a little bit about, for those who haven't seen the DJI LiDAR system in action, let me give you a little bit of this one. Let's see, we've got that live. Cut to that. So if I head in here into the, give you a little look at this. So if you swipe across on the control screen, the, the LiDAR's actually got a camera inside it. That's what that guy on the left there is. So this, this part's the LiDAR and that's a camera. And that's the preview of the camera. So it's actually showing you what the LiDAR's looking at. And the little box around there is my noggin, and it's telling me how far I am. To, to calibrate this, you only need to tell the, the LiDAR system two focus points. It asks you to focus on something for every lens, that is. It asks you to focus on, some, focus on something a meter away and then four meters away. And just by getting those two measurements, it somehow manages to build a profile of that lens and accurately uh, pull focus on manual lenses, which is crazy. Now, if I push the trigger, you'll see that box go green and that's enabling active track. So now if I stand up, well, maybe not. That should have happened. Oh, it could be that I, the tilt has disabled. Let's have a quick look, active track. I don't know, that's all working. That's interesting. Push the green button again. Ah, it doesn't want to do it. Not sure why that is. Unless it's something to do with my little remote here overriding it. If I turn that guy back on. And then hit the trigger button. And then we hit it again. Oh, that's very strange. Oh, sorry about that, folks. I was hoping to show you the active track in action because it's actually quite interesting. It's got a really kind of organic uh, style to it. Let me just jump back to here. Yeah, I'm not sure why the RS3's decided to stop doing that. I could restart it, but then it's going to kind of mess a few other things up. But yeah, when you, you're, normally when you push that trigger and the, the box goes green, you enable active track, and then when, that, when you start moving around, the RS3 Pro keeps you framed up moves the camera where it, wherever it has to. And when you turn it up to its fastest setting of active track in terms of its sensitivity or follow speed, it actually looks pretty cool and organic. Personally, I feel that anyway. Like it, I kind of like the way it um, yeah, follows you around. You can turn it down something a little slower and it kind of drifts a little more 
evenly, but yeah, turn up to its full setting. It looks a little bit more human and almost kind of twitchy the way it follows you, which again, horses for courses, it may not be the kind of thing you're into. Um, let's, uh, just trying to think if there's anything much else to, so we, we talked about the bokeh, so hopefully you saw that kind of difference in terms of the spherical versus the elliptical out of focus areas. Um, let me show you a quick uh, idea of the coverage when it comes to the Raptor. So if I switch across to that, um, let's go something like this. So we've got the, I'm just gonna flip around here. So you can see there at the top, that's currently on the 6K version. Now, I'm actually seeing a little bit of vignetting there. So you can see kind of in the top left, you see that little bit of shading that kind of says, you know, the lens isn't giving you full coverage at this. There's, there's not actually any other options on the red. So you can't, for instance, go down to 5K at, with a 1.5 squeeze. That's basically the only option that it's gonna give you on a Raptor um, when it comes to a 1.5 squeeze lens. So it will let you go to 8K, so let me quickly show you that. If I flip this guy around, just let me jump into the project settings here. So if we jump this up to, actually I'll give you, let me just jump to the phone really quickly so you can see what I'm doing. So you can see in here, I'll just go back up so you see how this works on a Raptor. So we'll jump into project and we're gonna go up to, we're gonna go into format. And then the section, second option here, which is the anamorphic options uh, for 8K, if we jump into there, this is where we can choose our squeeze factor. So you can see at 8K, there's plenty of options, but obviously you need a, a lens that covers this amount of sensor. So if I now jump, actually before I hit select, I'm gonna jump over to the Raptor and the C500. And if you keep your eyes on the top there, you're gonna see the difference once I push select. So that's how the coverage works on 8K. So obviously we're not even close to it being usable, but they haven't sold the lens as being able to do that. Obviously this is designed to be a super 35 lens. So then if I just jump back to the phone quickly so you can see what our usable option is, this is where we go down here to super 35, anamorphic 7K or 6K. And if we scroll down through here, you can see we've got all the two squeezes, the 1.8s. And now we're getting into the, the only one there that's 1.5 is the 6K 16.9 1.5. So that's the only option we've got. So again, I'll just jump back to the Raptor and we'll hit select. You'll see it jump back, jump back in there to give us the coverage that we actually wanted. So that's just a little idea of the coverage of the lens. Um, and I could probably give you a little bit of a feeling for that focus characteristic that I was talking about as well. So if I kind of, and also the minimum. So this is the 50 mil that's on the Raptor at the moment. So if I just pull focus here to, that's basically minimums there. So I'm about, I think, 80 centimeters away from that lens. Um, I could probably tell you the, I think it's 0.7 is actually, 70 centimeters is actually the, the, the true minimums on this lens. Um, yeah, if you kind of rack, rack focus backwards and forwards, you can see there's not really much by way of breathing, which is pretty nice for a lens this cheap. Um, you'll definitely have one thing that uh, some of the cheaper anamorphics get is actually a variable squeeze. So as you pull focus, the squeeze factor changes, which is pretty nasty. It's not really something anybody wants to see. Uh, but these, yeah, they hold pretty strong. So if I go all the way, that's one end of the lens and that's the other. It's pretty decent. So that's holding nice and solid in terms of the squeeze factor and there's nothing really by way of breathing. Um, yeah. So I guess the, as far as how I perceive these lenses in the market, I think they're great bang for the buck for sure. One thing that it's kind of woken up to me is this, when it comes to the squeeze factors, it almost feels like 1.5 isn't enough to really make it worthwhile. I think it is when it comes to, that when you've got something this small and this cheap, it kind of makes it, compensates for the lack of squeeze factor. Uh, so I guess my mentality with it would be, come for the flares and stay for the 
compact form factor, but you're not really getting much of the other, a heap of the other anamorphic characteristics. Um, there's a few others on, out on the market. I think Sarui's got a 1.8 squeeze that's, that maybe is a little bigger than this, but it's still kind of a, a, a micro anamorphic. And there's a few others that are working on it as well. So yeah, I mean, that that's probably, I'm still gonna use these for sure, like throwing a couple of Komodos into a Peli case with a, a full set of prime lenses and being able to go anywhere and shoot anamorphic is very attractive to me. And you can still bang, light, bang little lights into them and get these beautiful flares and kind of get that sort of a cinematic feeling without a heap of effort. Um, and obviously flying them on things like gimbals, they're so lightweight and they're so small. Um, there's heaps and heaps of benefits on that front, but I'm definitely, feel lucky and pumped that I've got my Orions. I've got the 45 mil and the, uh, sorry, the 40 mil and the 65, and I'm hoping to pick up the 100 eventually. Um, they still have, yeah, a little bit more of a cinematic and classic anamorphic characteristic to me than, than I guess the, the 1.5s do. Um, but I mean, they're, you know, they're less than a 10th of the price than anamorphs, so you can't really complain. Um, I think that's about everything I wanted to talk about, unless anybody wants more info on the, rangefinder systems like the TOF one. If you want me to go through anything else on that, I could probably take you through some of the configurations, although it gets a little bit techy and maybe not the best live content in the whole world. Um, but by all means, hit me up if you've got any questions. Uh, and what I might do, what, how, what, how much time have we got? I might just quickly restart this RS3 Pro and see if we can get the active track working. So bear with me on that. I'll come in here and this thing's going to flip around and we'll start her up again. So actually, let me grab the phone. I'll just quickly show you. Let's go to this one. Okay. So I'm running this system backwards so that I can see the control screen, which is why it's on reboot. It's gone and pointed the other way. So we can just spin it around using the joystick here. And on my way around, let me just show you what you get here with the rangefinder. So at the moment it's flashing red. So what you want to do is you push function twice, double tap, and that's going to start an auto calibration on the lens. And when that finishes, you should get a solid red light. And that means that the, it's currently usable with the, where's he gone? the little focus wheel here. So if I spin that, you'll see I'm able to use it as a follow focus. But now if I push this AF MF button, the light goes green and now you've got autofocus happening. So it can hold three lens profiles. So if I go back down here, move this around so you can Get my ugly mug in there, but catch all that funky looking bokeh in the background. Swipe across, you can see the preview there. Let's see if this active track's designed to work. There you go. Let me just double check what setting I'm on. So if I go into active track, I'm on slow. Let me crank it up to fast. Now you can get a feel for how that follow happens. So there's your active track working. It's got funny ideas on how to frame, but still, it's kind of cool. I can, there you go, got, got some framing back there. I can see some use cases for that. If I turn that speed down, active track, slow, and now, Move back around again. You can see it's a little bit more controlled. It's pretty impressive. Oh, hello. You got me. Now, if I jump back here, I'll just quickly show you. So, you can see there the lens profile. At the moment, I've got two in here. The top one there, that's my Solaire HS 25mm um, that I actually run with a speed booster on the Komodo. And this thing, so it basically means I'm shooting effectively 
T.9. And this rangefinder basically holds focus perfectly. Like tack sharp, even with the minimums on the Solaire, I think is something like about here. And it'll actually hold something tack sharp all the way up to that. It's crazy impressive. So I had that on a job the other day with the RS3 Pro on the top of my Steadicam Zephyr. And I was using it kind of like an Arri Trinity so I could rotate the post down to the ground, have the camera skimming along the ground and then bring it up to head height. Just running around like a maniac, didn't have to worry about focus at all, completely wide open on a Solaire at 0.9 and this thing held it the whole way. So there, the second profile I've got, there's the um, 35mm. Unfortunately, you can't put any other kind of identifiers in there, so I can't say, hey, it's an anamorphic, so you just have to remember which lens is which. And then you can hold the third one in there as well. Let me bring this back. Now, it's kind of cool with the... Oh, that's my brother just said I look gorgeous. Look, I'm going to have to put this one up. I'm going to assume Johnny G is my bro. Thanks, man. Back at you. Now, the cool thing with this little tilter remote is so this button here actually represents the trigger that's at the front of the RS3 so if I push that now I'm going to disable the active track so if I move it's not following me anymore and then I can use the joystick to frame it up and then if I push the button again now I've got active track back so this is the control that I was using on the Steadicam so I had this mounted on the post and um, yeah, this was super, super handy because then I could actually execute little crane moves where I was sort of slowly using the joystick to control the tilt as I craned up with the Steadicam. So I'll definitely do an episode on that if people are keen. Have I got active track there still? Yeah, so I'll kill that. So, I mean, this RS3 Pro I'm insanely impressed with. Insanely impressed. Let me jump back to my little... this guy. Yeah, the, the RS3 Pro for the money, for what it does, for what it can hold. Like just, it's just got that little bit of extra clearance at the back compared to the RS2. So you can, in this case of a Komodo, you can build a nice rig with a slightly heavier lens, kick the camera back a little bit and even run a V-lock on the back like I've got at the moment. Um, and then when you combine it with this $750, that's Australian, $750 LiDAR rangefinder focus, sorry, LiDAR focus system, it's just bonkers what you can do as a solo operator. It's absolutely crazy. And there's some, I, I haven't had a chance to get into the YouTube rabbit holes on it, but I believe some people have managed to get that thing work, the, the LiDAR focus, get it working off the RS3 Pro. So I think you need to have it on the RS3 to, to calibrate it and build your lens profiles, but then there is a way to power it without the RS3 Pro and actually have it run the focus, the focus um, motor on a separate build. I mean, DJI is crazy if they don't package this thing up, take, take whatever's in the brain of the RS3 that's related to that focus system and sell it as a standalone module. They will sell gazillions of those things. You just, it, the, the power it could give you on um, being able to shoot with manual lenses and having you know, things like autofocus is, is, is just crazy. So I'm hoping that someone convinces them to do that. Um, just trying to think if there's much else to talk about with the um, if anyone's interested in the Teradex system, let me know. I mean, I probably spent between 15 to 20K getting that system put together. So it's a completely different um, price bracket. You're talking about, you know, three motors, a, a pretty decent hand controller. So, I mean, the little wooden, wooden handle there is a third party thing, but you know, you've got a, a controller there with your focus. You've got your uh, iris here and you've got a zoom rocker here so you can control three lenses plus if you actually get it talking to the camera with some form of camera control you can use these sort of dials here to control ISO or shutter speed and different things like that so it's you know it's a very fully featured it's more of a professional focus puller system um, the range the top one rangefinder look I haven't I haven't sort of had a chance to keep my ear to the ground on how people are feeling about it. My suspicion is that it's probably been a little underwhelming for some people, mostly because of how narrow the field of view is on the on the rangefinder itself. I think they've got the TOF 2 in the works, which might be something a little bit more substantial or something with a little wider, um, wider pickup pattern or pickup range. Uh, 
the other cool thing is things like that Teradex system can work with uh, things like the focus bug. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. That's where you can actually get a little chip that you put on the talent. You can have like three, I think maybe three or four maximum at the same time. And then the, the, you can actually autofocus between those, those bugs. So whoever's got the bugs on, you get a little readout on the system that tells you where they are and you can actually jump between each of them with your focus system. Or you can just use the data. Like I said, you don't have to have the system autofocus for you. You can just see the data and then as a focus puller, make the decision on where you want to go when. Um, so there's a lot and, and you know, there's, there's obviously the much bigger, more fully featured expensive systems like CineTape and C-Motion and the Preston systems and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, I'll admit I haven't used this Teradex system as much as I thought I would. Um, I don't want to say I wasted the money, but it, I've just, just had a motor blow on me, unfortunately. So just tried to do a firmware upgrade upgrade, and it bricked one of the motors. So that's got to be sent back to the States now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a little depressing when you've spent 15 to 20 K and then you go and spend 750 on the guy at the bottom, the LiDAR, and it just knocks your socks off. The limitation being that it has to be on the RS3 Pro really to use it to its full capacity. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's interesting to kind of see the difference between the two. Actually, what I might do is turn the active track back on and just do the little walk up close again up here. So you can see, you know, how well you, you, hopefully you'll be seeing the comparison there between the two. You've got the, the Teradex system jumping in and out with its narrow little sort of field of view. And then the RS3 is kind of keeping me pretty sharp the whole time. I'll just turn that active track off just because it's a little harder to tell what's going on from the focus perspective. But yeah, so if I kind of do that little walk again, so if I'm coming straight up, it's not too bad. I'll try that again and go straight towards the Orion so that you see how that rangefinder capes, uh, copes. Coming up to there. And yeah, you can even sort of come right into minimums, which is about there, I think. So yeah, like I said, the, the, the Teradex system isn't really marketed as an autofocus system. It's really that rangefinder. If you plug this hand controller has a USB port, actually, sorry, there's a little Lemo port on the top of it that has a USB cable on the end of it that goes, I think it's micro USB, goes into the small HD range of monitors. And then you can enable an overlay on small HD within their page OS soft, page OS, what is that? I think it's called page OS. An overlay that actually puts a little uh, measurement bar on one side, and then you have a little tick that slides up and down and shows you what the distance is that the rangefinder is detecting of whatever's right in front of it. And then, like I said, you can make those decisions on focus. Um, I mean, products like CineTape have done that for a long time, but this is a much cheaper, as far as I know, compared to some of those. I think the rangefinder might have been around the two and a half grand mark just for the rangefinder itself. <clears throat> the minimum you need to make it work, you wouldn't have to have this full three axis system that I've got. I think you can get a single axis system with a smaller controller and they've even got a little miniature MDR now, which is quite a cool looking little device. So there'd probably be cheaper ways of getting the kit together. Maybe it's not gonna be the full like 15 to 20K that I spent, but have a look, it's, pricing's all on the Teradek website. Um, let me have a quick look at some questions. So Jasper, the LiDAR's sold out everywhere. Really, I didn't know that. I'm usually one of those nerds who as soon as it comes out, I push add to cart, check out the second it gets announced because I'm sad and I'm addicted to gadgets. So I suppose that's why I got mine. Um, and another one here from Jasper. Can you balance the RS3 Pro with the Komodo and a V-mount battery? That's exactly how I've got it now. So let me give you, if we go to Nano plus phone. So if I come over here, so there's, that's the SWIT battery plate for the Komodo. And there's a little, I think that's a Dyna mini V-lock that I'm running there. Um, so that's, yeah, completely possible. So I've had my Solaire, 30, uh, Solaire 25 mil, which is probably more like about out to here. 
and much heavier than the Nanomorph. I've had that balanced on this successfully with a V-Lock on the back. The other one that comes in really handy for me with the RS3 Pro, which some of you might have seen, is the, the base plate stage that, um, that the camera sits on that actually has a V-Lock plate on the bottom of it. Um, that allows for a much bigger bill on the top because of the way the center of gravity works. The other thing that I got recently is the DJI transmission folk, uh, wireless video system, which is really impressive. A little bit noisier than I was hoping, but as in uh, audible noise, not, not uh, visual noise in the image. Like it's, it's a loud unit when you turn it on, but that can actually sit underneath the RS. It, there's a little like, it's kind of like a hot shoe clip that kind of slots in underneath the RS3 Pro and a cable that will actually power the transmission system off the RS3 Pro. You'll chew the battery probably a fair bit quicker, but it's a really neat little package. And then you've got, some people are saying five to seven kilometers of range on the DJI transmission, which is crazy. And the fact that the receiver is a monitor is I think really cool. It's, you know, you've got a, high, a really nice high quality seven inch high bright monitor. Um, that's your receiver. And I've, done, I've added on a few live gigs lately where I've got the little um, module for the back of the monitor that then gives you an SDI or a HDMI output. So if you're feeding it into a live broadcast, you can do that. You just position the monitor at ops and then run the cable into the switcher. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I'm also thinking of with that Steadicam um, build that I'm gonna show you guys, I'm probably gonna end up using the transmission monitor and sort of finding a way to mount it on my post so that I can do all the crazy kind of up and down moves, but I can still see the picture squarely right in front of me. So no matter where the camera's moving, the, the, the monitor stays right in front of me. Um, so that's gonna be a nice little rig that I'm hoping to put together. Um, let me see, what else can we talk about? The 20, maybe you, I'll give you a quick look back at the C70 here. Just for the curvature factor. I'm not sure if there's, if there's any lines there that can kind of give it away. To, oh, yeah, you can sort of see there. If you see there on the, where am I? Here we go. Uh, there, on that door frame there. You can kind of see the bend. So it's, it's to be expected with an anamorphic that wide. I mean, my Orion 40 mil has a little bit of curvature on the outside edges of the frame. Um, but yeah, that's something worth thinking about with anamorphic. Again, you're not going to anamorphic lenses for sort of a surgical clinical perfect image. You're going to them for some funk and some fun and something that sort of gives it a little bit of an organic, interesting characteristic. Um, again, you can see there the elliptical out of focus areas, but there's something about, I don't know what it is about anamorphic, like just the way, like if I'm sharp there on the C500 that is on the far left of frame, the depth of field just feels cooler on anamorphic. And again, it's way cooler on a two by squeeze than it is on a 1.5. But even on a 1.5, there's just something about, and you know, maybe it's partially to do with the letterbox that kind of instantly makes your brain think you're at a cinema. Um, but there is something about the depth that on anamorphics I find a lot more pleasing than I do on spherical. If I just pull, let me see, where are we? Sharps on the C500 there, you kind of come through to the background. It's probably a little easier at the other end. But yeah, I mean, it's only really on the vertical lines that you kind of notice that pin cushioning or the, the curvature on the, on the extreme edges of the frame, but definitely something to be aware of. You're not gonna see that on the, say the 50 mil, that's gonna be a much more rectilinear image. I think that's about it. We're still under the hour mark, so Unless anyone's got any other questions they want to fire at me, really appreciate, appreciate everyone uh, tuning in and having a watch. Um, again, sorry it's been so long. A lot of cool gear that I've managed to acquire since the last few streams I did. So yeah, should be able to um, yeah, make a few more interesting little case studies. If there's anything people want to know about, hit me up. Little Callum just said the shadows on the C70. They are, yeah, the, the, the the black, I, can't, I, th I think I'm just using the straight 709 light there. Let me just jump back to that one. Sorry, just one sec. Yeah, so that, I think that's just the, the straight BT709 light that comes with the C70. I've been playing with a couple of custom lights in there, but I haven't really found a good workflow that, that does it in a way that doesn't mess things up for me later on. Um, 
But keep in mind as well with all of this live stuff I'm doing for you now, you're not, re you're not really seeing the full potential of the cameras because we're only using the monitoring path in each case. So we're, only, we're using their live output, whereas when you actually record it to their native you know, R3D file or in the case of the C70 and MXF, and then you post-process it properly, you're going to be getting way more out of it than what you do in this kind of live situation where I'm just taking it straight off the, the monitor monitoring output. So that's worth uh, mentioning as well. But it is a bit, fun, a bit of fun to kind of take the, the live outputs and do this sort of side-by-side -side comparison. Um, looks like the chat's been spammed by some kind of dating site. So if anyone out there's feeling lonely, you know, xxx69.biz is there to help. Uh, Matthias, Matthias, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, still, these are the blue edition nanomorphs. So yeah, I, I, at the time I, I went in on the Kickstarter, I think blue was the only option. And they came out with the flare colors later. And I sort of felt like, yeah, blue's always been something that I thought was cool. And it kind of matches what I already have with the Orion. So I stuck with that. I'll go back to the old side by side. Yeah, I mean, you can see the blue on the Nanomorph is a little bit more of a, what would you say, like a teal or a turquoise kind of a blue, whereas the one on the Orion is, is a bit of a richer, slightly purple, but um, a bit of a richer blue. So yeah, interesting to see them side by side like that. Just move this guy a little bit, fix the framing up. Yeah, so like I said, the, the plan for me is to have a little one of those Pelican 1650 cases and have three Komodos or the two Komodos and the Raptor and then, you know, three or four or, four or five nanomorphs in there and be able to go around and do some really cool documentary interview sort of stuff that has a really stylized look to it. Um, worth noting, I think Lau has already said that they're working on a 65 and an 85 um, to add to the nanomorph range and there might even be longer ones up into the hundreds or or so down the track. The case that I got for them, which I haven't got in front of me right now, actually has five slots in it. So it's got a space for the 65 and the 85 ready to go. Um, so that's gonna be pretty cool. Just one little tiny, actually, why don't I grab it for you? Just one sec. It's, surely that's useful content. It's right here. Sneak into the camera room. So professional of me. Here it is. So that's the, that's the case. So you can see there how the tough one's handling the focus. <laughs> oh, the DJI is just winning. It's, 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 it's tough being a $15,000 rangefinder and not being able to match up to a $750 one. So if I pop this guy, grab these couple of things. So you can see there, so there's the ones I've got now, the 27, 35, and 50, and then they've got a spot here for the 65 T2.4 and an 80 mil T2.4. So good to see that there's a bit of a, you know, future pipeline of lenses that are gonna come out and they're all gonna fit into this one tight little case. Um, another comment here from Jasper. Wondering about the clearance on the back of the RS3. Yeah, so I think, I don't really know that tilt to plate. The Swit one's nice and compact, like it's pretty flush to the camera. I think I know the tilt to plate you're talking about, so hopefully by the time you stick a battery on that, you'll, you'll be right with clearance. Obviously, the heavier the lens at the front, the further you're gonna have to kick the camera back, which might start to get close to knocking against the back of the RS3. But if the lens is light enough, then yeah, it should, pardon me, should open up a lot of possibilities. The, um, the stage at the bottom that has the V-lock goes underneath, I think that's a tilter product, I'm pretty sure. And it gives you a couple of two pin Limo power outs. It gives you, I think, two PTAP power outs. So you can power up some accessories or some transmitters or something off that as well. So that's a handy little one. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Where are we? 8.54, last chance for questions. Um, I don't think there's much else I can really show you. And thanks so much for listening. Anything else? Best place to ask questions outside of here? Oh, that's a good question. I'm so slack with this stuff at the moment. Probably Instagram. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably the easiest spot. I don't really, I, sh I should be better at using the YouTube community section, but um, haven't gotten great at that. So yeah, either, there's a contact form on the Greats Media website, greatsmedia.com. 
Um, otherwise, yeah, for quick stuff, Instagram messages is probably best. I've, I've been trying to stay off Facebook because, well, I guess Instagram's the same, isn't it? But Facebook just makes me feel pretty gross in general. So um, I haven't really been paying too much attention to the Greats Media Facebook page, I'm ashamed to admit. So yeah, if, if you've got any other questions, hit me up on Instagram. Um, and otherwise, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll hopefully recharge over the Christmas break and next year get into some way more regular content and uh, yeah, try to maybe even do a few, bring a few more other people in and do some live discussions, maybe a little bit of, um, yeah, interviews with some, some of the DPs that I respect would be something that I'd love to do. And um, obviously there's enough gear here to shoot an interview as you can see. Um, that's it. Thanks so much, everyone. Might call it a day there and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheers.